It is OpenAI's Dev Day in San Francisco, London, and Singapore. And considering I am <laughs> born and raised from San Francisco, I figured I'd be going. Well, to be honest, I was actually invited by OpenAI to come. So uh, thank you to OpenAI for uh, giving me an invite to your Dev Day. I've never been to a Dev Day before in my life. So I'm headed down to Mission Street to catch the 49, which is a bus here in San Francisco. I grew up taking Muni all the time and I'm headed down to the Fort Mason Center. It's going to be close to like an hour ride, but you know, I'm up and early and uh, really excited to see what's going to happen. So let's go. just got off the bus and I'm walking towards the Fort Mason Center. I am pretty hungry so I'm excited that they're giving food and also coffee because I'm a little bit tired and I need some of that caffeine to stimulate me and keep myself awake and aware of what is going to be unveiled to me today. We have made it into Fort Mason on the way to the OpenAI Dev Day. That's where we need to go. So I just got my badge and I'm about to get some breakfast. I don't know, but I think we're all just eagerly awaiting the keynote address, so stay tuned. I am being basic with avocado toast for breakfast and this breakfast mini burrito right here. first are you the guy from that video and I was like yeah I'm the guy from the video so I guess I should have expected that but um, <laughs> it's just funny because I don't I don't I don't think it's a very flattering face of me that I made so kind of embarrassed that that's gonna be the face that uh, might be immortalized in the history books so let's take a look at a quick example of terror thought in ChatGPT. 
So I'm not going to go into the detail, details, but that's essentially a brain teaser, which is non-trivial. That requires the model to do quite a bit of logical reasoning. And so as you can see, the model is going to reason methodically about the problem, thinking through each line, each sentence of the problem, and making sure before it answers uh, that um, the, the answer meets all the requirements for my question. Now I know, that's probably the most common uh, question I've got. What the heck is the name O1? Uh, the, shift, the shift to reasoning introduces a new shape of AI capability. The ability for a model to scale and correct its thought process is pretty mind-blowing. So we are resetting the clock, and we are introducing a new series of models under the name O1. But let's look at a few customers. A few of our customers tested O1 to see what it could do for their use case. First, um, I wanted to talk about cognition. Cognition. The thing that's that's interesting about programming is that it's it's changed in shape. Yeah. Free swag to collect at this time, or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, do you know what size you would like? Or Medium. Okay. Yeah. Oh wow. Oh, thank you so much. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Looks like I got a sweatshirt. An open AI sweatshirt. Oh my goodness gracious. Wow. Open AI Dev Day hoodie. It is official. Very nice indeed. Got five minutes to wait. Well, uh, yeah. I'm actually placed calls. I thought it was going to start at four, but I guess we're going to be waiting for a little bit. Um, yeah, this will be exciting. I, I think Sam's in person. I, I didn't know if he was actually going to be here in person. I mean, yeah, honestly, I think he'll be in person. There's two chairs up in the there, which I think he'll be sitting in one of them. And so this will be very fascinating. What's my favorite announcement today? Uh, yeah, to be honest, I feel like I'm so, so such a novice on all this that I don't have a great grasp of what the power that they're unveiling is today. I think I mean, increasing rate limits and making the costs more affordable is good. Um, I'm really interested in trying out the API playground and seeing uh, how to how to use it with their new features that they've integrated today. But yeah, that's mostly mostly what's impressed me so far. 70 seconds away from showtime. And we have an yeah. SEO Here we writer go. that will create a full on 2,000 word SEO article um, for you and um, make that undetectable with high-end AI images and stuff. My vehicle. Yeah. Oh, wow. There he is.
But I think if you just do the one next step of making it, you know, very agent-like, which is on level three, and which I think we will be able to do in the not distant future, it will feel surprisingly capable. Uh, still probably not something that most of you would call an AGI, though maybe some of you would. Um, but it's gonna feel like, all right, this is this is like a significant thing. And then the, the leap, and I think we do that pretty quickly. Um, the, the leap from that to something that can really increase the rate of new scientific discovery, which for me is like a very important part of having an AGI, I feel a little bit less certain on that, but not a long time. Like I think all of this now is gonna happen pretty quickly. And if you think about what happened from last decade to, to this one, in terms of model capabilities, and you, you're like, eh, you could, I mean, if you go look at like, if you go from like 01 on a hard problem back to like four turbo that we launched 11 months ago, you'll be like, wow, this is happening pretty fast. Um, and I think the next year will be very steep progress. Next two years will be very steep progress. Harder than that, hard to see with a lot of certainty, but I would say like not very, and at this point the definitions really matter. And in fact, the fact that the definitions matter this much somehow means we're like getting it close. What do you see as the current hurdles for computer controlling agents? Uh, safety and alignment. Like, if you are really going to give an agent the ability to start clicking around your computer, uh, which you will, <laughs> you, you are going to have a very high bar for the robustness and the reliability and the alignment of that system. Uh, so technically speaking, I think that, you know, we're getting like pretty close on the capability side, but the sort of agent safety and trust framework, that's gonna, I think, be the long term. And now I'll kind of ask a question, it's almost the opposite of one of the questions from earlier. Do you think safety could act as a false positive and actually limit public access to critical tools that would enable a more egalitarian world? The honest answer is yes, that will happen sometimes. Like we'll try to get the balance right. Um, but if we were fully OLA, didn't care about like safety and alignment at all, could we have launched O1 one faster? Yeah, we could have done that. Um, it would have come at a cost. There would have been things that would have gone really wrong. I'm very proud that we didn't. Um, the cost, you know, I think would have been manageable with O1, but by the time of O3 or whatever, like maybe it would be pretty unacceptable. And, and so starting on the conservative side, like, you know, another thing, people are complaining like, oh, voice mode, like it won't say this offensive thing and I really want it to, and you know, <laughs> a horrible company, and let it defend me. You know what? I actually mostly agree. If, if, if you are trying to get O1 to say something offensive, it should follow the instructions of its user most of the time. There's plenty of cases where it shouldn't. But we have like a long history of when we put a new technology into the world, we start on the conservative side. Um, we try to give society time to adapt. We try to understand where the real harms are versus the sort of like kind of more theoretical ones. Um, and that's like part of our approach to safety and not everyone likes it all the time. I don't even like it all the time. But, but if we're right that these systems are, and we're gonna get it wrong too, like sometimes we won't be conservative enough in some area. Um, but if we're right that these systems are going to get as powerful as we think they are, as quickly as they, we think they might, then I think starting that way makes sense. And you know, we like relax over time. The mode of voice is like tapping directly into the human API. How do you ensure ethical use of such a powerful tool with obvious abilities of manipulation? Yeah, you know, voice mode was a really interesting one for me. It was, it was like the first time that I felt like I sort of got hit back and like really tricked by an AI in that when I was playing with the first beta of it, I couldn't like, I couldn't stop myself. I mean, I, I kind of, like I still say like, please to chat GBT. Um, <laughs> But in voice mode, I like couldn't not kind of use the normal niceties. I, I was like so convinced, like, ah, oh, it might be a real, per like, you know? Um, and obviously it's just like hacking some circuit in my brain, but I really felt it with voice mode. Um, and I sort of still do. Uh, the, I think this is a more, this is an example of like a more general thing that we're gonna start facing, which is as these systems become more and more capable, and as we try to make them as natural as possible to interact with, 
uh, they're gonna like hit parts of our neural circuitry that would like evolve to deal with other people. And, you know, there's like a bunch of clear lines about things we don't want to do. Like, we don't, like, there's a whole bunch of like weird personality growth hacking, like, I think vaguely socially manipulative stuff we could do. But then there's these like other things that are just not nearly as clear cut. Like, you want the voice mode to feel as natural as possible, but then you get across the uncanny valley and it like, at least in me, triggers something. Uh, and, you know, me saying like, please and thank you to ChatGPT, no problem, probably a good thing to do, you never know. Um, <laughs> but, but, but I think this like really points at the kinds of safety and alignment issues we have to start in our relationship. Sam, when's O1 going to support function tools? Do you know? Uh, before the end of the year. There, there are three things that we really want to get in for... Uh, <laughs> uh, We're going to record this, take this back to the research team, show them how they're going to do this. Uh, but there, I mean, there are a handful of things that we really wanted to get into O1, and we also, you know, it's a balance of, should we get this out to the world earlier and begin, un, you know, learning from it, learning from how you all use it, or should we launch a fully complete thing that is, you know, in line with it, that has all the abilities that every other model that we've launched has? I'm really excited to see things like system prompts and structured outputs and function calling make it into O1. We will be there by the end of the year. It really matters to us, too. My question is, there are many agencies in the government at both the local, state, and uh, national level that could really greatly benefit from the tools that you guys are developing, but have perhaps some hesitancy on deploying them because of you know security concerns, data concerns, privacy concerns. And I guess I'm curious to know if there are any sort of you know planned partnerships with governments, world governments, once whatever AGI is achieved, because obviously if AGI can help solve problems like you know, world hunger, poverty, climate change, um, government's gonna have to get involved with that, right? And I'm just curious to know if there is some uh, you know, plan in the works when and if that time comes. Yeah, I, think, I actually think you don't wanna wait until AGI, you wanna start now, right? Because there's a learning process and there's a lot of good that we can do with our current model. So we've, We've announced a handful of partnerships with government agencies, some states, I think Minnesota and some others, Pennsylvania, uh, also with organizations like USAID. Uh, it's actually a huge priority of ours to be able to help uh, governments around the world get acclimated, get benefit from the technology. I mean, of all places, government feels like somewhere where you can automate a bunch of workflows and make things more efficient, reduce drudgery, and so on. So I think there's a huge amount of good we can do now. And if we do that now, it just accrues over the long run as the models get better and we get closer to AGI. Thank you. No, I, I mean, You're I, not I, a paid actor. <laughs> no, I am not a paid actor. If you can see here, I actually wrote down what my yeah. question was uh, right, yeah, before yeah, yeah. I, right before I asked yeah. it. So, no, not a paid actor, but I, I am associated with government agencies, so I, that was a genuinely okay. important question. Which one? Uh, NASA. Nice. Yeah. So, I just walked to this bar afterwards. Um, and I just met Sam Altman, which I wasn't expecting that. I didn't film it, but I do a picture being close to him. I didn't want to oppose, but I didn't think I'd meet Sam Altman today, and I just met Sam, Sam Altman and asked him my follow-up question. So that was pretty cool. Hey everyone, Kyle here, post-conference. I wanted to end with a post-dev day reflection now that I've had a day to think about the events. And before I continue with it, I want to say thank you to Ray Fernando, who was a conference attendee that I met. Really nice guy. He let me borrow his iPhone charger. And without him letting me borrow the charger, I would not have been able to record the Sam Altman fireside chat. And so I'm really grateful to Ray. Check out his channel. He's a former Apple engineer of 12 years. Now he's making videos and I'm sure they're they're amazing and interesting. So please go subscribe to him. So I was glad I, I was making this vlog because it kind of helped me remember a lot of the day's events because I sometimes I think when you're filming, you are kind of so concerned about the the 
recording and and getting the right shots and it kind of takes you out of maybe being able to think in the moment of what is actually happening but it's nice to be able to replay the videos and see what was happening after the fact and so i remembered a lot after watching and re-editing these clips and a couple of things stood out to me i've also taken some of my notes here and wanted to share some of them with you all. So I think the main thing that I took away from other conference attendees was that there was maybe a little bit of letdown. Uh, I think a lot of people were expecting more than what we got with the prompt caching and the uh, vision fine tuning and the real-time API. I mean, those are all great, but I think people were really waiting to see things like vision real-time vision capability kind of how the demo from OpenAI was promoted i don't know how many months ago now where you can sort of point your camera and it can interact in real time and and talk to you with voice mode what it sees and i think of course gpt5 wasn't really a highlight of the day uh i think it was brought up but it was it was like please wait you know have this to hold you over for now so I do think talking to other people, there was maybe some minor disappointment that we didn't get major announcements on those things. Me personally, I was just kind of there as an independent observer. I wasn't really looking for anything specific. I, I was mostly just being a curious bystander. And, uh, you know, I met a lot of amazing people um, that I still need to connect with LinkedIn. So if you're waiting for me to connect with you on LinkedIn, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'm trying to get this vlog out before it's you know, too late. I also happened to talk with a couple of OpenAI employees throughout the day, and they were very nice. They were very polite. I'm not going to say who they were for privacy reasons, but it was interesting to hear about the work that they do. But of course, they can't really go into great detail because of you know, privacy concerns or, you know, they want to they want to release the details of the O1 model. And I was actually talking to someone who who worked extensively on O1 at the conference, and I was telling them how I've been making these videos to test it. And he was pointing out that a lot of the stuff I'm testing, of course, is in, in the distribution training set of O1, which I figured as much, but I'm still curious to know how it performs. And I think the next part of my channel on this next month of October, I, I really want to participate in this competition that's being held by Scale AI where they're asking experts in different domains to submit questions that they would be very impressed with LLMs or or just models, AI models in general, being able to solve. And so I think this next month, I'm going to be working really hard towards coming up with novel questions that are going to be out of the distribution of any deep learning models data set because I do have some creative questions. I think that there's no prayer in heck that like they exist anywhere on the internet because they're going to come from here. And so I'm kind of excited to get creative this month and, and try and relearn enough complicated physics to to create solvable but difficult graduate level physics questions. So I'm excited about that. Hopefully we'll test some of those questions that I... Uh, make on O1 when it comes out. And I think one thing to sort of continue on the point of sort of secrecy and closed research, I wrote something down here that, that kind of kind of disappointed me. And it was after talking to one of these open AI employees where they said, don't hold your breath in terms of expecting research papers. Actually, someone else was talking, was asking them, oh, can we expect to see a, like a publication on the details of the OAN model, and he, this OpenAI employee said, don't hold your breath. I'm a little bit disappointed by that, but I, I'm trying to see it from their perspective. And of course, they want to stay ahead of the competition, and they've obviously got a great head start on, on a path towards AGI. And so I could understand why they wouldn't want to perhaps give the competition that insight into their models. I am really trying to embrace a more open source and transparent framework into doing science in general. Obviously, there are privacy concerns. You can't do that with every kind of science, especially if it involves like medical information or 
or you know, sensitive information like that. But in general, when you can, I think it's it's better to be more transparent and have an open source workflow. You know, provide code, provide notebooks, provide detailed methodology. And the fact that they're not doing that, like I said, I can understand from maybe a competition perspective and also maybe a safety perspective, right? I mean, another thing that I, I didn't even think about in all of this in the past 24 hours is the fact that the United States and China, let's be real here, are competing with each other in terms of trying to gain supremacy in the domains of fields like artificial intelligence and quantum computing, right? Perhaps OpenAI, um, uh, perhaps I'm sure they're more than well aware that China is making significant strides to being a global powerhouse in artificial intelligence. And perhaps not open sourcing their model, their O1 model has something to do with that. I don't know for sure. I wasn't told that. Please do not uh, take my words out of context. This is just me thinking about it. And if it's obvious to any obvious to anyone else, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, you know, I mean, I'm new to this. So, you know, I've been trying to think of different angles as to how this all is going to play out and why certain decisions are made and trying to give benefit of the doubt when I can, but also staying fairly skeptical, critical, maybe, if uh, I feel like something isn't fully making sense to me. And so that, I think, covers most of what I wanted to talk about. Okay, wait a minute. How could I forget about talking about meeting Sam Altman? I mean, I think that's something else I should bring up. I did talk a little bit about it in my post dev day stream yesterday, but I'm thinking about it some more. And obviously Sam is a basically a celebrity in the AI space. So he was very busy. He was surrounded by a huge group of people. And so I was surprised I was able to get the FaceTime I got with him. And um, I was introduced to him by the person who invited me to the dev day. So this was an open eye employee who just brought me to Sam and said, hey, this is Kyle. Uh, he's the guy who makes the videos and he's been doing testing of one and I, expand, I told Sam in that moment, yeah, I was the guy who asked you that question about the government's partnerships um, during the fireside chat. And when I told him, oh, yeah, I, I do work at NASA Ames Research Center, he was like, oh, it makes sense that why you would have asked that. And, you know, he basically just said, you know, it, it's just hard. It's really hard to get government on board. And obviously, Sam went to Capitol Hill last year as well, with, um, along with other CEOs in Silicon Valley to discuss the rising concerns about artificial intelligence. So I don't want to claim that they're not doing their part or not doing anything towards making governments aware, because I did know that, that they did that. So um, there is that. But I I still think that there is this major concern and people have, have asked me after, after yesterday, some people who knew I went to the conference who are my friends or my family, they really want my opinion on, you know, is this, is this safe? Do you think what they're doing is safe? Is there enough discussion on safety and alignment? And to that, I wish I could give a more thorough and comprehensive answer and a more well-researched answer, but if you want my honest take in the moment, I think more really needs to be put towards safety and alignment. I don't really know the details about their safety and alignment team. All I know that I've recently heard was when Ilya left, there was also their head of safety, I believe also left, Jan Leica, who went to Anthropic. And so I don't know where that team is now, but I, I hope they have a team in place that is actively working on this. And I'm glad Sam talked about it during the fireside chat about safety because I, I kind of forgot, like I said, I was kind of in the mode of just of just uh, trying to film. And I'm sorry for my shakiness, by the way. I I was trying to write notes while holding the camera while also not trying to get the blocking, you know, anyone's view. So it was, it was shaky and I don't have the most steady hands. So what are you gonna do? But okay, so I think that is, kind of all I wanted to say for this. I know it kind of summarizes where I'm at with all of this, but again, I'm very grateful for OpenAI for, for inviting me to come. It was, it, was a, it was a very wonderful experience. I hope to be back for future dev days and see the progress they make, but I will continue to try and be as objective and as 
you know, nuanced with my takes as I can be. And I want to be able to use the tools that I've developed throughout my years of education during my PhD to keep a critical eye on these developments and tell it as I see it as, be- as best as I can, because you guys know I'm not an expert in AI, but I'm trying to, to familiarize myself as quickly as I possibly can. And I appreciate you guys for watching this content and uh, sticking with me throughout all my ups and downs as I try and figure all this stuff out in real time. So thank you again for watching. I will be back with more videos in the coming days and weeks, and I will see you all later.